Well, as always, we appreciate uh, you taking the time out of your busy schedule to come and meet with us here at our convention. Um, and I know that our, our convention members here are really excited to hear right from you as the changes that are coming. Uh, the low interest rates that are coming back to municipalities was very important. I know that uh, through our membership and through our advocacy, that was something that Alberta municipalities worked on, so thank you very much for that. Uh, and we are also really excited to hear about the $8.6 billion going back into building schools. So I know that we've got a number of municipalities across the province that are ready to start building schools, so that's going to be vitally important as we move forward. Maintaining civility in politics is increasingly a challenge and the lack of civility and respect deters people from running for office. What responsibility do you think all elected officials have in all orders of government have in terms of setting the tone for public discourse? Well, well look, I mean, I think what you do here um, is, a, is a model of, of how we should conduct politics. Because I, I would hazard a guess that there are a number of different political stripes in this room for how you vote provincially and federally. And yet you're able to come together on a council and make construct, constructive decisions for your, your citizens. And I, I think that's really important. We, um, I, I was on radio, as you may know, for a long time. And my, my view has always been that you can probably find common ground with every single person that you talk to and if you work to try to find that common ground then it makes the next area of agreement easier to find so uh, we we do try to focus on policy issues that's kind of my my approach I, I I will debate anybody on policy and I think that there's some important robust policy debates to have but I, I think every one of us have um, an obligation to you know watch the language that we use I'm sort of guilty of it sometimes but I do try to, to conduct myself in a way that uh, that I think is respectful to others so that uh, you get treated the way you treat others is my view and my experience with uh, sitting down and speaking with you has been just that and I can think of the one um, during a roundtable I had with you we were talking about um, the transition to possibly a provincial police force and so I asked the question like what do you think about this and, and you said we probably don't think the same, but you were willing to have that conversation, and so I appreciate that. But, you know, I think that's a good example because, you know, just because a, um, uh, there are a number of communities wanting to switch to a municipal approach or a, a sheriff's detachment or even look at a regional police force, and we have, I think, 15 to 20 different municipalities that have asked for that, and some that are in that transition. That doesn't mean that every community wants to do that. And so we're prepared to provide grants to municipalities to explore those options. In the case of Grand Prairie, they made the decision that they wanted to switch to a municipal force. And, and we're going to support that decision. So I would say that we want to be able to enable and give you options. Um, you may have seen with Bill 11, we have now elevated our sheriffs to uh, police. They're going to be governed with an oversight committee similar to a, a commission that you have at a municipal level. They are going to be available to, to open up detachments. We have about 600 officers right now that are doing highway patrol and scan and surveillance and fugitive apprehension, which has been very successful. And so um, you, we, we're trying to create more options for you as well. But that's, I think, the, the partnership that we need to have. It's not every municipality wants to make a change, but some do, and we want to enable that. Will the government of Alberta ensure provincial allocations of capital funding for school construction cover all costs of construction, including the servicing of school sites with the required infrastructure? Um, in January, Minister Guthrie expressed an openness to discussing this with his colleagues. So can you pro provide an update on your plans to provide the necessary municipal infrastructure funding to support the new schools? I'd probably need to understand a little bit more about those costs because I, I, it sounds to me like historically we've just relied on the municipalities to, to build up to the school site. And, and in fact, that's what we would be hoping to do because there has been at least one instance where we gave the money and started the construction, but it wasn't, uh, the, the site wasn't ready to be hooked up to all of the, the vital municipal services. So um, I'd, I'd be interested in knowing what, what uh, you're proposing, what the cost would be uh, on servicing each site, because um, we, we obviously want to make sure that we have a, a healthy partnership here. We don't want our school construction to be slowed down because a, a site isn't ready. And so, I don't know if you can tell me now, uh, just to give me some context for what 
uh, the implications are for costs, and then I can take that away. You've got you got some I, some Treasury Board members here. You've got Nate Horner and you've got Rick McIver here. So we may as well start the conversation now. Yeah, absolutely, and we'll get you that information too. What it costs to get a, a school on online. This, because I get to ask the questions, I'm going to move this one up a little bit. Our members, our member municipalities are increasingly raising concerns about the rate of homelessness in many communities across Alberta and the corresponding increase in municipal expenses to address the issue. We know your government is attempting to manage this challenging issue, so can you share your plan for affordable housing investments? Yeah. Well, there's a couple things I'd say. Um, the, there obviously is a very serious opioid crisis um, it's not and it's not just fentanyl we've also got crystal meth on the streets and 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 other really dangerous drugs it's um, it used to be I think the largest population in Calgary and Edmonton but we see it in Wetaskiwin we see it in one of the communities I represent in Medicine Hat we see it in Red Deer and I think some of the solutions that we've tried in the past have been successful to a point but that's why we've focused in on adding the additional piece of recovery to everything that we have right now. Red Deer, for instance, just voted to, to, to shut down their permanent uh, safe consumption site. And we want to be responsive to communities. If it's not working for you, we want to find a different approach. Dan Williams uh, talked about what we're going to do instead, have an, a mobile unit bring in more um, personnel who can deal with specific issues. We've got a recovery community in Red Deer, and we also have a therapeutic living unit within the corrections facility as well in Red Deer. And so we're hoping that this combination of factors gets people permanently on the track to recovery and, uh, and off the street permanently so that they're not either creating some of the community problems or engaging in crime, which we know is also a problem in, in, uh, in rural communities. We, have, we also have to work with the municipalities because I, I know not to not to pick on Wetaskiwin, but I know that sometimes council moves forward with an idea or a zoning or a proposal, and then there's a community voices push, pushing back against it. And that creates some, some difficulty for us of knowing, do we go forward or do we not? Does it have community support or doesn't it? So I think we have to identify where we're going to house those who find themselves in that situation. How do we work together to build the wraparound supports? It's going to look different in every community. We can do a navigation center in Calgary and Edmonton that we lead because we can connect people with a bunch of different services. And we've connected people, we've connected 4,400 people to ID and the opioid, um, virtual opioid dependency program so they can get Suboxone or Sublocade, detox, um, recovery communities, housing, income supports. We've done that, I think, pretty effectively in Edmonton. We've rolled it out to Calgary, but we need to right size that approach for each community, depending on the size and their local conditions. So uh, J Jason Nix is, is leading this effort. He's in the process of developing a rural strategy. And I think if we can find a model that works in a mid-sized city, then that becomes the model that we can use in other cities. We don't have the answer yet because we, we really did just roll out the navigation center and we're, we're quite surprised at how effectively it was able to to um, uh, get people connected to services. That's why we did it in Calgary, which was just at the beginning of July. So we are, we are intending to try to find this kind of approach in every community, but it's, it is gonna, going to require us to work together to properly zone, figure out the right services, and then work together to address some of the, the local uh, citizen uh, resistance there might be on, on some of those projects. Is there a way that the provincial government can partner with municipalities with that communication? Um, well, in all of our communities, we'll have that, that NIMBY mindset where um, obviously you don't want a homeless shelter in your backyard. And I mean, nobody does. But the fact is, is that the homeless population is growing across our province. We're seeing uh, in centers that already experienced homelessness, their numbers doubling and other municipalities who had never experienced homelessness in their community are now seeing it. They've gone from the invisible homeless where they were couch surfing to actually having uh, encampments set up or you know, like, like we've been having in Edmonton and Calgary and Red Deer and the other bigger cities, but it's now spilling out into the smaller communities too, especially around the big centers. So recognizing that we have, um, that we need different approaches and different municipalities, but there's also the need for the 
the whole wraparound services for that social programming to, for it to be totally. effective. Because yeah, we're speaking the same language, totally agree. It may be that we need to develop a working group with Municipalities Association of those communities that are impacted. I don't know if it's, when I, so you've got a really effective mid-sized community group as well, which I believe is populations of 15,000 and up. That may not encompass all of the communities that are impacted by um, by this particular problem, but I'm, we're committed to, to trying to find a solution that works for those communities. Acknowledging that it, it isn't a, a problem for everyone, but let's find the, the solutions in the areas where it's the most acute and then see if we can roll that out to others. Good, thank you. Property owned by government of Alberta, such as schools, hospitals, and courthouses, are exempt from property taxes. Recognizing that municipalities must provide infrastructure and services to these properties, the province has compensated those municipalities each year through the grants in place of taxes. However, in 2019, the GPOT program was significantly cut, which placed an unfair financial burden on Albertans that live in municipalities with provincial facilities as they bear an increased property tax burden to fund these properties, while Albertans from other communities use those facilities at no cost. Can you explain the hesitation to fully fund the GPOT program to support municipalities that have provincial facilities? Well, that's a great... <laughs> A, a great question for you to put to my president of Treasury Board a little bit later. Uh, do know that I, I've, I've been asking that myself. I wasn't um, part of the decision making around that, but um, I, I know that question was planted by Mayor Sohi. He asks me that every time I, I see him. Uh, look, we, we're committed to looking at that because I need to understand the, the rationale by it, behind it. I need to understand the impact it's having on each community. Obviously, Edmonton, because we have so many provincial buildings there, is the most impacted. But I, I would imagine that it's, it's probably impacting each community. So maybe it's another thing you can follow up with us on. Yeah. If you can give us some, some feedback, because uh, Mayor Sohi sure has, about what the difference would be for, for his community. We just need to understand what the... Um, what the impact would be. And we're going through a budget process right now where we're identifying high priority areas that we've got to address. Um, and, and municipalities, we did a lot of work together on the new funding framework, but there may be some more work that we need to do. So, so get that information to us. We start our budget process in the fall, and then we have a new budget coming out in February. So um, this would be the right time for us to, to figure out what the cost of that would be. Perfect. So this is me asking all of you to find out what your what the cut in the G-Pot is to your municipality and make sure you get that information to us so we can pass that along to the Premier and the Government of Alberta. In Budget 2024, the province increased provincial property taxes by 9.2% and forecasts to increase that tax by 4.5% in the 2025-2026 municipal sorry. In the 2025-2026 budget. Municipal councils required to add that to Albertans' property tax bills. How are municipal councils expected to minimize increases in property taxes to their residents when municipalities are forced to increase the provincial portion of property taxes on behalf of the province? Mm -hmm. Well, I wouldn't mind having um, a conversation with you about how we set assessments and rates because the approach we've taken at the provincial level is to keep the same mill rate that's the approach but i know because of growth that that ends up resulting in us getting more revenues and we'll get 2.7 billion but i i can tell you what what we hear from from residents is that the way in which we do assessment on an annual basis um, and the average mill rate change um, isn't the lived experience of a lot of people because if their property is increasing faster than the average, then they might end up with a 30 or 40% increase in a given year. And, and there have been proposals that have been put forward about how we could create a, an, a rolling assessment, like a five-year average, so that you end up with more stability from one year to the next, which would mean you could end up with more stability in your mill rate from one year to the next. I'm, I'm very open to having that conversation with you because it, um, we, we hear the same frustration. We're, we're trying to be, uh, to be uh, minimally intrusive, which is why I think my finance minister's recommendation has just been set the mill rate and let's just go with that. And then we work on providing 
uh, targeted grants back to your communities to see if we can address, address some of the issues. But maybe there's a broader discussion that we need to have about how we do assessment on, um, on an annual basis so that we can create more stability and have less pushback. I've also, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm, I always know when I get into radio show host mode and my staff, they tighten up because they, know, they don't know what I'm going to say next. But what the heck, I may as well, I'm already halfway there. Um, but it does strike me that we've done an assessment about whether Alberta should collect its own personal income taxes. And my minister has told me if we did that, we'd have to have a parallel system and it would cost us a billion dollars in administration. That's why we've decided to stay with uh, having the federal uh, government collect our taxes on our behalf. And yet we have the reverse relationship with all of you. Like you have 320 tax departments that are all collecting taxes to remit to the provincial government. Is that, is that the right way to do it? Like maybe it started off the right way to do it. Maybe we need to have a different conversation. Like if we were to say, um, if you would like to uh, redeploy that staff somewhere else and you could opt in to us collecting on your behalf and rebating to you, would any of you take us up on that? Would that be something you'd want to do? Is there any way that you can work together between municipalities to have a, a common da tax department so we can reduce the amount of burden on that so that you can put those dollars towards uh, the programs that, that are more meaningful to your, to your citizens? I just know because we've gone through the exercise. We actually did the assessment of whether we should have our own tax authority. And ideology aside, it just doesn't make financial sense for us. So if it doesn't make financial sense for us, how does it make sense for you guys to have 320 different tax departments and then everybody's mad at you about what the tax bill looks like because they don't see the difference between the province, what the province collects and you collect. I'm just starting the conversation. I see the room is dead quiet, so obviously I have not struck a note here. But it is, those are the kind of things that, that we need to figure out. I just, I feel like this is a, a source of a lot of frustration for you because I think we make you um, do a revenue neutral rate and then you have to do an increase like what would what if you just did the same thing as we did and you just had the same mill rate year after year because we had a more regular way of assessing um, the assessment value of your properties is there a better way we can do this just know I'm open to the conversation and I will hear from Tyler on that one afterwards I'm sure I think you have 1100 people in this room thinking of how great it would be if a tax bill came from the province, not the municipality, and maybe not everybody yelling at us. So I think they're quiet because they're daydreaming about how great that would be. Well, well, Minister of Tax Collection, um, let's see if we can have that conversation. So let's get, but I, I don't know, what, I'd, I'd, I'd actually be very interested to know how much resources and money that would free up for you if we took that burden off of you. And so I'll, I'll leave it to you to, to know that we're open to having the conversation if you are. Awesome. Well, I know that you've committed to meeting with, with me and Alberta municipalities following our convention to hear what our members' main concerns were and how we're going to continue to build that relationship moving forward. So on behalf of the association, I want to thank you and your government for taking the time to be here. Uh, and we definitely